Uh, good morning and welcome to the Minneapolis County City of Del Rapids joint meeting. Uh, if you'd stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Again, welcome, and especially to the city of Del Rapids uh, City Council. Uh, we're glad you're here, Justin. I think you said you do have a quorum here this morning, so we're in good shape with that. Um, remind people to silence their cell phones if they would, please. And if you need meeting documents, they're available in that white binder on the corner. Uh, if you need a listening device, Carol can help you with that. Uh, with that, we'll go to item number one on the joint uh, agenda, and that's a, t a motion to approve the agenda. So motion moved. to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second. Do we need the same motion from the city, please? And you'll have to give us your name, because I we, most of us recognize names and faces, but I can't remember everybody. Thank you, Gary. Is there a second? Thanks, James. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Uh, the second item on the agenda is to consider a motion to approve or deny a request to vacate highway portion of the 66-foot dedicated road beginning on the north edge of 246th Street, also known as South Dakota State Highway 115. The roadway is lying between Lot 1 of over a Overveg, I'm sorry, track two and Overveg track eight, including lot one and lots one and two of Buskerud subdivision of Overveg. Is that, oh, that's not right, is it? Overvog. Overvog. No, it didn't sound right, sorry. Overvog track two and extends to the northeast corner of lot one of Buskerud subdivision of Overvog truck se track seven and northwest corner of Overvog track eight including lot one, all in the southwest quarter of section 8 t 10 4 n-R49 West, Minnehaha County. There's going to be a test on this when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. David Heinold, County Planning Department. What we have for us is a public hearing to consider a, a request for road vacation, which is approximately a quarter mile west of Del Rapids along 115. So the property, so right here to the south, we got 115 and then, so the subject, the request right here is, is goes straight north from 115 along here in the, the area that's shaded in red. And all of the properties that are situated along this are laying adjacent to the property all have access to either 473rd, which is just just beyond this portion of the, the roadway that's the request, and as well as if you extend to the north, you have Golf View Drive, which as you continue around the corner, um, there's also another driveway. This is also the other, the northernmost access point that is part of the public right-of-way, but it serves as a driveway to get to one of the interior lots back here, which also has access to 473rd, direct access. Um, this this portion right here, it, there's no, um, everybody has access to a road, either Highway 115, 473rd, or Golf View Drive. Um, and in addition to uh, the southern property, which is the applicant also has access to 473rd through an easement across the property to the, directly to the west of this um, so this, if the, the vacation is approved, then this portion that's highlighted in red, the 66-foot right-of-way that hasn't been developed, and I'll go through some picture or just a picture that I took. Um, this has been dedicated as a right-of-way, um, which would eliminate the uh, a front yard setback for each of the properties because there would be no longer a roadway there. Um, so each property owner would get 33 feet split down the middle, according or going east and west of that road just drawing a line straight down the middle of that line um, notice of this meeting was scheduled on july 11th um, for as in, in accordance with south dakota codified law 
Um, so staff finds that the public would be better served by the proposed right away vacation and recommends approval of road vacation 1702. Um, so the county commissioning and city council action should be taken to approve and deny the, or deny the request to vacate the 66 foot dedicated roadway as described in the resolution as attached. Um, and just the picture of that just looking straight north from highway 115 the undeveloped portion as you can see there's developed on both sides um, with residential housing um, and then this is looking south on that driveway public road access there looking off to the right of that image as you would continue on towards the that right away that red area so if you have any questions i'll be glad to answer them thank you okay thank you uh does the city of del rapids have any questions for planning and zoning at this point, do Commissioner that long driveway on the north side there is that a permanent easement? You, you keep saying it's a public access, public dri or private driveway. How does what's the legal process on on that, or what what is that? I guess. Well, the plat shows that it's a sixty-six foot right of way. The on driveway the that goes to that property that's yeah. tucked up in the to the to plat. the property. So as you continue on east of the red shaded area, it becomes a driveway because it's their pro it's the property owner's property. Okay, so the driveway begins at the tip of the red yep. shaded area, but up until that point, it's a public street? It's dedicated as a public right-of-way okay. on the plot. Okay, okay. Same as the red shaded area. It's and the same. No way that any of these properties will be subdivided. These are large properties. There's no intent of anybody to subdivide them in the future. No, all of the it. properties in this, the rural residential f five, which we call it, is there's a minimum of five acres you have to have for, and all of them are at five acres. So they, they would have to go through an additional process, rezone, and it'd have to go before this body. I guess it begs the question, why was this public right of way put in to begin with? Uh, future future access for subdivision um, and now that you have the highway there you have additional access points um, there's opportunity to provide access for their, the development if there, they wanted to subdivide if they it. wanted to okay pursue so that we're, we're beyond that now is what you're saying there's no potential for anybody wanting to subdivide and there's no need for this road moving ahead then yeah and and that would be a future discussion that would be had if it, if it's potential for municipal annexation or anything like that or sanitary sewer yeah. uh, i'm done complete. uh commissioner heiberger i just wonder if it'd be a little helpful um david if you'd pull up that map that shows the different tracks that's a, a drawn map instead of that it shows the layout of the subdivision a little bit better have that one I think we do oh. that one there it just shows that the original that I assume that was the original plot that was laid out it just shows the streets a little bit better and so that shows the unnamed roadway, which is also the 66 foot dedicated right away. That's that red shaded area. I didn't have a comment. I mean, I just had a comment. Anyone else have any questions for David? If, if you don't mind, I have one more. Sure. Who decides to put that unnamed roadway in to begin with? Was that the developer or was that at the request of the county? That's when it was platted. So it so was, was platted with that, but so the developer asked for so it. So ultimately that was approved by the planning commission. Okay. At the request of the commission or at the request of the developer to put a road in? Uh, I'd have to, to look into that. I'd haven't I haven't didn't know if there was a procedure, that. if there was a, a Yeah, reason. so it went through the planning commission. Okay. Does anyone from the city have any comments um, or if is a petitioner or a representative of the petition here today? 
you have any comments you'd like to make, you'd need to come up, sir, to the microphone and identify yourself, and we need your address too, please. Uh, my name is Daniel Witte. I'm the, um, I, I submitted this. I own the uh, lot one of track two. Um, Daniel, can you give us your address, please? Oh, 13. 1303 Clark Avenue, Del Rapids, sorry. No, that's fine, thank you. Um, I talked to all the adjoining landowners of this unnamed roadway, and they all were in agreement to vacate it. I have Bill Klein just to the north of me, then it's Mitch Ryberg, number two. Number one is Mitch Ryberg, and then uh, the Overvag track eight was Russ Nelson. Um, we all felt an agreement that it, you know, and the state is not putting, on South Dakota Highway 115, they're getting rid of the approach for that unnamed roadway. They're not, they're redoing that highway and they're not gonna put that approach in. So, um, we just thought for the safety and, you know, for just the e simplicity, it'd be the easiest just to get rid of that, I guess, so. Any questions for Daniel? Anyone from the city have any questions for him? I'm sure you've heard this before, multiple times probably. Uh, since the city really has, I think, priority in this conversation, even though we both need to either approve or uh, deny, I think uh, I would entertain a motion from the city first. Mark Crisp, motion to approve. Thank you, Mark. We have a motion and a second from the city to approve. Is there a motion from the county commission? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to also approve. Do we need a roll call vote on this, Judy, or do we, since we have a quorum? Um, just to be safe, should we do a roll call? Do a roll call. I think we will do a roll call just to be safe, if that's all right. Uh, we have a motion from the City Council of, of Del Rapids to approve. Uh, Mark, do you want to start? Yep. Mark Chris? Yes. Bill Schmidt? Yes. Barry Bird? Yes. James Butcher? Yes. Michael Garrett? Yes. Mayor Hoff? Yes. Okay. We have a motion that's been approved by the Del Rapids City Council. Uh, we have a motion and a second from the County Commission to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes from the city and the county. Um, Daniel, you have your project ahead of you. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, we also have on the agenda any old business. If you have any old business as a joint Commission, Justin, do you have any old business, any new business? If not, then uh, the joint meeting of the co commission and the council is adjourned and we'll go into the Minnehaha County Commission agenda. Thank you gentlemen for coming, appreciate it. Yeah, I guess we legally need a motion to adjourn as you walk out. Bill Schmidt, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, do we need one too? We need a motion to adjourn the joint meeting with Del Rapids. Second. Can we walk out after ours? <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion and a second to adjourn the joint meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Now we're to the county commission agenda. I'm looking for a motion to consider to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item two is to approve the minutes of July 25th. So sure. moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the July 25th county commission minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Uh, second item is to approve the amendments of the joint Sioux Falls City Council and the County Commission minutes. I make that motion. 
Second. There's a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion unanimously passes. Uh, bills to be paid of $353,214.58. Motion to pay them, but with a comment, please. Okay. Second. So a motion and a second. And comments, Commissioner Heiberger? Um, I just wanted to comment that under the Public Defender's Office, there was a bill for a mental health psychological examination for $8,500. Um, I did ask on that. It was on a homicide case. Um, this is something that, you know, the state is trying to work on. Obviously, it's an issue. Uh, in this particular case, I don't know that it, we could have decreased that cost uh, because of the type of evaluation it was. But I just want to make note to the public that those evaluations are out there and they're expensive. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Barth? I'd also comment on a couple bills there. Uh, it includes uh, 50, uh, 57000 for XL Energy, which... Uh, Air conditioning is costing us all more these days. And we have $26,000 that went to the ambulances. Uh, Gerritsen and Humboldt each got 12500 and Jasper got their 1000 Any other comments? Not. We have a motion and a second to approve the bills. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item four are reports of the county coroner for June 2017 and for the second quarter of the year. Item five is personnel action. The first item is to consider a motion to approve routine personnel action. Motion to approve routine action. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second to approve the routine personnel actions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item B is to re recognize the significant employee anniversaries. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. I have a relatively long list of anniversaries for you today. We have Derek Golbrunson in the Sheriff's Office, Dennis Wojciechowski and Lindsay DiMatteo all celebrating five years of service and Dennis is with JDC and Lindsay's with the Public Advocate's Office. We have Robert Olson, Wyatt Walton and Ben Boxa, all CEOs with the jail celebrating 10 years of service. Rod Hahn with the highway celebrating 15 and Deb Johnson with planning and Gigi Iosti celebrating 30. And you, you see we have Gigi here and as much as I tried to convince her to come to the podium, I was unable, but. <laughs> <laughs> Deb's in the back Deb's, too. Deb's, Deb's in the too. back too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> come up and stand. I'm not very convincing. <laughs> you know, for as long as some of these people have been here, nobody ever wants to come to the microphone. <laughs> it's rare. Yeah. Well, thank you for your years of service. You guys are all obviously wonderful employees, and we appreciate your dedication and commitment. And I, I've been here for six years, and rarely do I ever get complaints from people about staff, and that's pretty unusual. So thank you for your service. And in uh, 30 years, you'll have as many as they do. <laughs> uh, there's no chance I'll be doing that. <laughs> now, if you want to talk about complaints about commissioners, Barth is at the head of that list. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I'm kidding. I can take it. Uh, uh, we also have volunteers who are a huge support to the county, and if you have a significant number of those, too. 292, again. Is, I don't know how many months in a row that we're near 300. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. I don't know how many additional employees that would mean to us because I don't know how many hours exactly it is, but that's uh, significant contributions also. So thank you to right. those individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's no applications today for abatement, no notices and requests. Uh, item 8 is the first reading of an authorization for the county auditor to publish a notice of a public hearing on an amendment to the 1990 revised zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County, which could be held on August 22nd at 9 a.m. at the county commission office. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Scott Anderson, County Planning. And uh, today I'm asking for... Approval to authorize the auditor to publish a hearing notice on October 22nd at 9 a.m. in this room. Uh, it's a rezoning request to rezone approximately 80 acres to the Eagle Ridge Crossing Plan Development, which is a mixed-use development. This is uh, uh, about six miles west of Sioux Falls at the uh, junction of uh, what is 41st Street and what commonly called the Wall Lake Oil. So it's about a mile south of Wall Lake. 
I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. I've prepared the hearing notice, uh, provided it to the auditor, so it's ready to go. Any questions for Scott? Is there a motion to approve the first reading? Motion to approve the first reading. Second. A motion and a second to approve the first reading and publish the notice of that hearing on August 22nd at 9 a.m. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Uh, item B is a first reading and authorization for the auditor to publish a notice of a public hearing on amendment to the 2002 revised zoning ordinance for the Minneapolis County and the City of Sioux Falls for August 22nd at 5 p.m. at a joint meeting at the Sioux Falls Council and Minneapolis County Commission. Once again, Scott Anderson, you're going to be uh, busy that day because this is setting a hearing date for the same date, but at 5 p.m., so August 22nd at 5 p.m. at Con Carnegie Town Hall. This is a, uh, a zoning, rezoning request to rezone approximately seven acres from A1 Agriculture to C Commercial. It's located approximately half a mile south of the Renner Corner on South Dakota Highway 115. It's the location of Grace Baptist Church. They are re requesting to rezone their entire seven acres from A1 uh, Agriculture to C Commercial. Uh, this has gone to the Planning Commission. I provided you the minutes. They recommended approval. Um, I'm asking to authorize the auditor to publish the hearing notice for that meeting on August 22nd um, at 5 p.m. I provided the hearing notice to the auditor office, the auditor's office, so it's ready to go, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Scott, uh, go, Commissioner Heiberger. Scott, if, if there's already a building on there and it isn't agricultural, why was it not? changed before um, a church is a permitted use within the agricultural zoning district okay. so, so it was a it would it complied to the agriculture zoning district uh, a church is also a permitted use in the uh, C commercial so we don't have any conflict with the uh, land use or con uh, the the uses within those districts okay. um, it it will allow them uh, the primary goal of the church is to allow themselves to have a little bit larger sign. Under the Ag District, they're limited to 16 square feet, which if you think about 16 square feet zipping along at 75 miles an hour, 70, you know, 16 square feet is basically four by four. This will allow them to go up to like 200 square feet of, of a signage, and that's ultimately the reason for their request. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Just a, as a point of information, those lots across the street are uh, grandfathered in from some previous eon thank you any other questions for scott no my scott um my background on the c in the city has c one two three four is do we just have a c we have one c commercial district okay and then we have uh we do have a uh, i1 and i2 which is a light industrial and a heavy industrial and uh, so we do uh delineate the two of those but for commercial we just have C commercial okay any other questions is there a motion to approve so moved second I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, reading first reading and the publishing the notice of um, the 2002 revised zoning ordinance for August 22nd at 5 p.m. And that's a joint meeting. Will that be held here or oh, at Carnegie Town Carnegie Hall? And I've provided all of the information to the city for them to put it on their agenda and alert the city clerk and what's needed there. Make sure we send them to the right place. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, item nine is petition for compromise. There aren't any today. We're two opportunities for public comment. If there's any item that's not on the agenda, we'd be happy to hear from you. We'd like to have you limit your comments to five minutes if possible. And uh, Mr. Colby. Five minutes may be a, a squeeze. <clears throat> you know, after being on the uh, county commission for a while, you. You develop a, a certain mindset, and I would imagine that anybody who's been in an elected position uh, does the same, whether they're on the city or the state. 
And when you see what's happening here more recently with all of the government things, whether city, county, or, or uh, state, or federal, uh, it always appears that the state legislature has a uh, con contentious relationship with the county commissions because they have removed like the personal property tax, uh, I don't know what you would call it, the, in lieu of get, collecting the proper, personal property tax, they gave the uh, counties money to replace that. They took it back, and for Minneapolis County, it was $500,000 back when, and that's a chunk of money even today. Uh, the, the state has limited the growth of property taxes by 3% or the inflation, whichever is the least. Uh, they've taken and capped the uh, bank franchise tax. They've done the same thing in Deadwood with the Deadwood gambling money. They've capped that and taken money back away from Deadwood. Yet they still cont uh, continue to give unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. I remember in here I was somewhat distressed when uh, the state's attorney, Mr. McGowan, said that he would no longer prosecute bad checks. Okay, leave it at that. You watch the federal health care and how they can't seem to get their, find their butt with both hands in broad daylight on the Capitol steps. Um, and yet the Senate and the House have health care we all would relish for ourselves and they won't even give that a consideration. Yeah, I, I just want the same kind of health care that John Thune and, and Mike uh, rounds have. It kind of reminds me of the line from Animal Farm, we are all created equal, it's just that some of us are more equal. <laughs> so we watch the feds do that, we watch the, the states can't seem to find oversight to do, deal with EB-5 or the GIRA program, let things happen. Who enforces the mandates that the state sends down to the county. The county graciously takes them and tries to support the effort financially without any kind of a, a financial background or financial support for that particular endeavor that the uh, state gives to each of the counties. One of the things that I've the, the state legislators don't seem to understand that when the property tax is collected, 25% of the property tax is divided between the city and the county. The rest of it goes to the schools. And they don't understand that it takes three years of property taxes to support one year of education in the schools. You have to, if you're in an average home, you have to pay property taxes three years in order to support one year of education of your youngster in school. So if you have three kids, you'll never live long enough to pay for the education of your kids. Yet they cap the property taxes that the county has to collect and that is reflected in what the county can do. Maybe it's time to say, no, we aren't gonna do this anymore. <clears throat> and let the counties take, be taken to court by the legislature and maybe the Supreme Court might say, you know, you just, you're responsible for taking care of the state, but you can't mandate something and not give support to it financially. I mean, it might be worth a try. It just might be worth a try because, you know, the counties are the ones that are seem to be the weak sister or the one at the end of the line because other governmental entities seem to get the support that they need financially. <clears throat> I'm glad to see that you that we are now getting the new structure out on, I don't know, is that North Kiwanis or whatever it is for the, for the uh, archives building. Bob Jamison and I started pushing for this. I think it's now just about 20 to 25 years ago. And I'd like to see it done before I tip over. I mean, we do need a place to archive all of the papers for the Commissioner Jeff Barth Life and Times. <laughs> so push for it. I have a few things that might be worth putting in that particular structure. Thank you. Thank you. And you are under five minutes. I'm pretty proud of you. <laughs>
Is there anyone else that would like to make any comments? Good morning. Good morning. I'm supposed to have a PowerPoint loaded on here. There we go. David, you, you need to give us your name and address. Okay, sure. My name is David Zokaitis, as you can see on the slides. And I live in Sioux Falls at 2215 East Mulberry Street. And I'm campaigning for mayor of Sioux Falls. And I figure that, you know, when I am mayor, the city and the county will have to work together. And I don't want there to be a whole lot of surprises. So I'm um, presenting today on something that I feel is important to the city and the county. But it's a long discourse, so this is part one of three. Drug prohibition. Let's see if a uh, page down works on this. Now, in the popular press, it's popularly called the war on drugs, but I think that the term drug prohibition is more accurate and more scientific. And when you can switch from rhetoric to science, well, then you might actually be able to accomplish something. So in my presentation, I call this drug prohibition and not so much the war on drugs. Now, you know, I've got this long hair and I'm talking about drug prohibition, so I want people to know that I'm an athletic, healthy, meditative guy and I don't do any of this kind of garbage. I don't do drugs, I hardly ever take aspirin, so. And I, I do believe that we should have policies based on science and evidence and fact and not fear. Now, when you look at papers and news media, there's a reports that, you know, drug abuse is growing. It's a terrible problem and causes crime. And methamphetamine is supposed to be particularly nasty, and we really should try to figure out how much of this rhetoric is based on evidence and truth and reality. So I found some statistics from the U.S. Department of Health. And for the most part, drug use is stable or even declining little increase in meth use, but if you look at the number of illicit drug users, meth is just is a very small part of that. So it's a big emotional issue, but not so much a big practical issue. Marijuana use is growing, and it's uh, amazingly popular. Half of young adults have used marijuana. Half. This is from the U.S. Department of Health, by the way. A few more statistics. Oh, about one quarter of the population is binge alcohol users. That's rather alarming. Since we're talking about drugs, we should mention tobacco. About half, a quarter of the population uses tobacco. And if you want to figure out where I found this, uh, there's a citation there. Here's a plot I found. Most drug use is stable or hidden down, except for that top part. That's marijuana, heading up a little bit. Methamphetamine use is not plotted because it's too small. It would fall off the chart, you wouldn't see it. Looks like drug use and abuse is all too popular. If half the young adults have used marijuana, we're not doing very well at keeping them off the streets. Apparently, jail-based prohibition doesn't prevent drug use or abuse. If you read the rhetoric about drug prohibition, we're trying to reduce addictions, we're trying to keep people safe. Hopefully it's got a minimal social cost. And, but the question is, does it really work? Do we achieve the stated goals? And no, we don't. Marijuana use, large and growing. People that try to feed their habit go in, on crime spree to pay for this stuff. The third bullet is particularly alarming. We've got the world's second highest prison rate. That's just terrible. And then you've got problems with civil rights violations with police that are kind of crazy. And if you look at what parts of society receive enforcement, it's biased heavily towards poor and black people. We're also subsidizing terrorism because opium out, guns in not what we want to do. 
Now, I, this is kind of a long discourse, and I only have five minutes at a time, so that's the end of part one. But I always end my presentations with a you know, pretty picture, and no matter how bad things are, we should try to look on the sunny side and enjoy life. This is a view out my car as I was driving somewhere between Sioux Falls and Lake Madison. So with that, good morning. Thank you, David. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to make any comments that, on an item that's not on the agenda today? If not, we'll go to item number 10 and we'll have a briefing on activities and events of the 2017 fair at the fairgrounds. Mr. Wick. Good morning, Scott Wick, uh, Swim Empire Fair. Thank you for uh, giving us some time this morning. First of all, on behalf of the board, staff, and myself, we want to thank you for your continued support. Um, we've been uh, working really hard to get up to this point this year for this fair. Weather's looking pretty good. I haven't seen any rain in the forecast, but it could change in 10 minutes like it did that time when we had to postpone Lee Bryce. I have a packet uh, with some VIP parking and admission passes for commissioners as well as staff, and I'll leave that with Carol. We have a really good lineup this year, a um, little more diversity than usual. One of the big names that's coming in is uh, Fluffy the Comedian, and we're getting a lot of calls on him, uh, probably more than any of the other entertainment. Um, unfortunately, it's been a new several times, that tragedy in Ohio, so we've had a couple of interviews with uh, local stations on that. It always, it seems like the last three years something's happened. So they've been out and our rides are inspected. They were inspected last week when they were put together. They're inspected as they're put together here in Sioux Falls and they're inspected every day throughout the fair. So we, you know, safety is the utmost, utmost priority. Um, I do believe Carol passed on an email where I invited you all personally out to the fair to take a tour, um, hook you up with, a, with one of our uh, board members and take you around the property when it's in its full use. We are the second largest event in the state uh, right behind um, Sturgis Bike Rally and we intend on seeing um, uh, close to 300,000 people for this fair. So again, thank you for uh, your continued support. The grounds are looking great. Um, with the carnival arriving uh, in the last couple days, the new uh, bathroom and uh, comfort station with the remodeled bathrooms, not only in the expo, but up there on the midway are very much appreciated and things are looking good. And I would answer any questions if anybody has any questions about coming out. Anyone have any questions? I hope you have dry weather, but I also hope it rains. So I, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of tough in the interviews because we, we are an egg fair, so we want light showers at night and <laughs> sunny, sun, sunny skies in the, during the day. I hope you get what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, I, I know that uh, several of us have been involved in the fair over the years. And uh, Scott, I, next week I am planning on wearing my uh, Sioux Empire Fair shirt. I didn't today. I thought about it, but I thought next week when the fair is ongoing, I would be wearing my uh, Sioux Empire Fair t-shirt from eight years ago when I was on the on the board but okay. uh, it's going to ruin my diet but I plan to go out there and uh, uh, they have really great uh, milkshakes at that uh, at that Pipestone uh, veterinary uh, building. Uh, Good shakes and three dollars a day all the milk you can drink. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any comments? Thanks, Scott. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your hard work. Uh, item 11 is a briefing from the Department of Legislative Audit on the 2016 County Audit. Mr. Schaefer, welcome back. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Schaefer. I'm with the Department of Legislative Audit. Um, this is, a, like I say, an exit interview for the <laughs> FY16 Fiscal and Compliance Audit. And uh, I think all of you have been supplied a, a management letter that uh, will be the premise of our discussion today. Um, I just thought I'd mention to you that if you have any questions at all concerning the audit uh, at any time, please feel free. Um, I'd like to just turn your attention to the second page, and, and this is going to be pretty uneventful, but uh, there, if you looked in the, in the center there, it talks about the three different uh, major areas, you know, for material or immaterial violations of laws or regulations or contracts and so on and so forth, and there are none noted, you'll notice, in all four areas. Uh, there, were other, uh, there were other less significant items that we discussed with the appropriate officials, you know, and potential adjustments and stuff like that. But uh, other than that, I'm sorry, I don't take up much more of your time today, but <laughs> unless you have more questions, I, that's basically what I have. So, Well, frankly, if you had a lot to tell us, we probably wouldn't be happy with what you told us. So. <laughs> probably not. So, yeah. uh, Anybody have any questions for Jeff? 
Mr. Chairman? Yes. You know, first of all, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I have to say that at times I've been somewhat critical of uh, our auditor. And this is, uh, I think, the best uh, report I've seen, actually, uh, in some time. And this, thank you, uh, uh, Auditor Bob. Uh, that said, Jeff, uh, can't we do it for a little less cost? <laughs> I, I, it is what it is. I, I don't have a whole lot of choice, uh, a whole lot in uh, in the bill, but uh, it is the number of hours it is, and the, the county the size it is, and the things you have going on. It just takes a while to go down through it. So, uh, but uh, it should be better this year. But I, I, you know, I oh. haven't looked at the ending numbers yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the guy that sends that out. So, <laughs> Commissioner Heiberger. Just up. Commissioner Barth thanked um, Auditor Litz, but I'd also remember the staff that's behind oh, yeah, very, Auditor very, Litz very much that so. did a lot very of work. So, there was yes. a lot of work going into the audit and, and just the work that goes in that office. So yeah, it was, it was a, too, yeah, Bob. a good experience the whole all, all around this year. It was very, very good. Anyone else have any comments? Again, thank you for your coming this morning and no. to the staff of the auditor and uh, we put them through the budget process and then we give them the real good news with an audit report. So we do appreciate the support that you do give us and the times that we have to call and ask for questions on things that we're not completely sure of, of things that we're considering doing down the road. So well, you're th welcome. we appreciate that help also. Uh, item 12 is to authorize the county sheriff's office to enter into an agreement with the airport authority to provide law enforcement officers at the airport terminal. You don't look like Captain Walsh. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Milstead. Good morning, I'll just introduce us. I do have Captain Mike Walsh here who will <laughs> receive uh, this operation from the patrol division. Uh, but I want to introduce this topic. Uh, on September 11th, 2001, uh, the Minneapolis County Sheriff's Office and Sioux Falls Police Department responded to the airport uh, in an effort to start securing uh, the airports as did law enforcement across America. And we were there for several months uh, sharing the duties with the Sioux Falls Police Department. And eventually uh, the police department entered into a contract to provide uh, services at the airport uh, for the certified law enforcement officer position that you see at the airport. They're there whenever there's flights coming and going from the airport to help secure the airport property. They're not the TSA type screeners or the contract screeners. These are certified law enforcement officers uh, uh, working in that position. They've done that well for the last 16 years. Um, I've, you know, through a number of chiefs and had conversations with them over the years. In some jurisdictions that that uh, job is performed by deputy sheriffs, and some it's performed by the municipal police agency. So it's, it's different across America, but uh, over the years, because those positions are staffed primarily with part-time staff, in, f in fact, all part-time staff, uh, it's becoming more difficult to find uh, officers to work that position. A, the number of part-time officers available to the police department is limited, uh, and B, the number of retired officers interested in putting back the uniform, putting the uniform back on and, and going back to work uh, uh, is it's not as popular as it used to be. And so we've had discussions. This is not a hostile takeover. This is a great relationship I have with, with our police department and our uh, regional airport authority. We've had discussions over the years at some point that maybe the sheriff's office could take uh, that responsibility on. What it does for us is it opens up a greater pool of candidates to use as part-time staff. I can hire, uh, if, if I provide the service out there, I can hire off-duty uh, Sioux Falls police officers, of which there's about 250 officers, so there's a bigger pool of candidates of active officers. Uh, I could still hire uh, retired officers from both of our departments, um, so it really is just a uh, I, I think the agreement is because is coming in place because uh, we recognize that, that the pool of candidates is bigger and so we can keep good qualified uh, professional officers uh, there. So nothing will change as far as the level of service. Uh, we, are re we will be reimbursed by the regional airport authority. I've had a great conversation and Dan Lettler is here from, from the regional airport. He's the executive director there. Um, 
Chief Burns and I have had these conversations. The mayor is aware of it, and, and uh, this is something that we think will continue to provide top-level service for certified law enforcement presence at the airport, keep the airport safe. It will be simply a changing of uniforms. We will have oversight over the officers. I will have my patrol supervisor primarily responsible for them. One of the officers will be a supervisor that we're going to, to employ. We'll likely employ some of the current officers that are out there working right now. They'll go through an application with process with us. Um, our costs will all be reimbursed, plus about 5% administrative fee to cover the auditor's office, the human resources, which, who has been very busy with us uh, preparing the posting for those slots. Uh, and, and they're active with us today. They're, they're active in working with us doing uh, deputy sheriff interviews for other positions. So we work really closely with human services as well. So there's some other costs. But in reality, we think it's a good thing. We think we'll protect the airport. Uh, and provide great service to the citizens, welcome the citizens to our community, and keep that air, you know, Sioux Falls Regional Airport the top-notch airport and the safe airport that it is. So with that, um, as I said, specifics of the contract, I have uh, Captain Walsh here and also uh, Dan Letlier from the Regional Airport Authority if you have any questions. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate Captain Walsh. Uh, if you'd like to give us some details, good morning. Uh, Mike Walsh from the uh, Sheriff's Office. As Sheriff Milstead said, we uh, we have worked out the contract with the with the airport authority, um, and, and in a very broad sense, the sheriff covered most of that. If you have specific questions about that, uh, as far as staffing or equipment or anything like that, I'm more than happy to answer it. Uh, the the contract uh, is modeled basically off of the Sioux Falls Police Department's contract, uh, so it, it, again, it's another indication that things aren't really going to change out there. We're simply changing the uniform uh, and changing to whom they report. Uh, as far as any other specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer any. Anyone have any questions for Captain Walsh? Dan, do you have any comments? No. Uh, you'll probably have to come to the mic, sorry. Uh, Dan Lettler, uh, Executive Director of the Sioux Falls Regional Airport. No, we're, uh, as uh, the Sheriff mentioned, uh, we've had a great relationship with the city. Um, you know, as times have changed and uh, their pool of candidates uh, they relied upon to fulfill this role uh, was getting more challenging. Um, their cost structure was going to have to uh, be adjusted as a result of that. Um, and also we're facing um, our own financial issues. We are had up to uh, this point been reimbursed for a majority of these costs uh, through the TSA. Uh, right now that funding um, has not been renewed so it's uh, you know certainly um, uh, for us to look, uh, make sure that we're spending our money as uh, wisely as we can. Uh, Sheriff Milstead and uh, Captain Walsh have been great to work with. We think we'd have a great relationship to provide this important uh, uh, security aspect of the airport. So look forward to that relationship. I appreciate that, Dan. Yep. Uh, not having security issues is a good thing. And obviously, uh, the quieter, the better. So Absolutely. we appreciate the services provided and sometimes take for granted. <clears throat> Anybody have any other questions? Is there a motion to approve the uh, contract with the Sheriff's Office and the Sioux Falls Regional Airport Authority? There is. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the contract. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, item 13 is to consider a motion to approve the resolution to set speed limits on Highway 145 to 65 miles per hour. Morning, DJ. Morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. I have before you today a request or a discussion to have about uh, setting a, a speed limit or passing a resolution to speed, uh, set a speed limit on County Highway 145. Uh, this is also, I guess, used to be known as South Dakota Highway 17. As you know, we recently took over that three-mile stretch of, of state highway, and now it's a county highway. Uh, this stretch of road was reconstructed less than 10 years ago uh, with a design speed of between 65 miles per hour and 70, mi or 70 miles per hour and has been uh, uh, signed as a 65-mile-per-hour roadway. Uh, 65 miles per hour is higher than any other speed limit that we have in our county. In fact, we have a resolution uh, on the books that says any county highway, unless it's 
uh, signed differently with the resolution accompanying that signage will be at 55 miles per hour. And so this is a little bit of a non-standard uh, roadway section for us. Uh, Lincoln County went through the same process within the last two years and they elected to keep it at 65 miles per hour after taking over from uh, the state of South Dakota. And so that's what we've prepared as a recommendation to the county commission is to keep it at 65 miles per hour to keep that consistency within the corridor and, uh, and keep it familiar with how uh, people are to driving that route. Um, the way that it is designed, it feels comfortable at 65 and we think that if we did change it to 55 that there would be an enforcement issue and uh, we haven't had any records of safety uh, problems out there and so we don't see it as a problem to moving it to 60 or keeping it at 65 uh, but want to have that conversation and answer any questions that you guys might have and and I'm available for that now any questions for DJ uh, Commissioner Karski so it's currently signed at 65 correct correct yes and this goes right by Wildwater West yes it does is, is that portion 65 also right there it is 65 and and because of the uh, an amount of turning traffic right there they have installed turning lanes okay. and so uh, with the turning lanes in place uh, they were comfortable when they did that design uh, to keep it at 65 that was one of the things that we looked at hard too was uh, with the amount of turning traffic should it be zoned at 55 and okay. and we're comfortable after reviewing the DOT's design that it, it can be 65 okay thank you any other questions is there a motion to approve so moved second a motion and a second to approve the 65 mile an hour request. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 14 is to authorize the chair to sign an agreement for preliminary engineering with Kimley Horn to evaluate and analyze the intersection Highway 140 and Highway 119, also known as the intersection of Rice, Holly, and Six Mile Road. Commissioners, a couple months ago, you uh, you heard a presentation from Phil Gunvaldson at IDG, or from IDG, about our intersection study that we recently completed. Uh, this intersection was one that was highlighted during the presentation as as an intersection that met warrants for signals or something else. He also discussed the option of, of installing a roundabout. Uh, the current uh, functioning of the intersection is poor, and and we need to do something soon so it doesn't continue to to get worse. Uh, causing some major safety concerns and so uh, we've we've sourced uh, an expert in traffic engineering and somebody that's done a lot of it's a it's a regional company but they've done a lot of work uh, locally with the city of Sioux Falls and the state of South Dakota uh, we've requested a proposal from them to uh, look a lot closer uh, IDG looked at more of like a 30,000 foot level uh, but we want a company to look a lot closer at the options uh, that we have for this intersection and, and do a little bit of preliminary design work and then we would like to follow up with this uh, later this fall or winter and do some design work for our construction project next year and so uh, the agreement before you is a, a preliminary engineering agreement uh, for them to look at I think three different options for this intersection and then do a 30 percent uh, preliminary design of the preferred option that we, we that we agree on and so um, Again, this intersection does meet warrants to do something uh, soon, but we're not really sure exactly what we need to do. And so this preliminary engineering agreement will give us a good idea of how to proceed next year with a construction project. Does anyone have any questions on this project? Mr. Chairman, uh, and this intersection really needs it. I'll make a motion to approve this contract. Second. A motion and a second to approve the uh, preliminary engin engineering contract with Kimley Horn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 15 is to authorize the chair to sign an agreement between Minnehaha County and the State of South Dakota Department of Transportation for bridge improvement grant funding for preliminary engineering for project BRO 8050-17-1 PCN 06 GY. Whatever all that means. <laughs> <laughs> That's the state's nomenclature for our project. Uh, commissioners, in, uh, at the end of last year, we, we applied for a bridge improvement grant. And in April, we were notified that we did receive a preliminary engineering grant for the replacement or for the uh, uh, 
uh, preliminary engineering of the replacement of this project. Uh, this bridge reconstruction uh, is going to be real similar to a bridge uh, that we did a few years ago uh, with the same consultant on the same road, uh, just a short distance down the road. Uh, the uh, item before you today is a funding agreement accepting those funds or accepting this project with the DOT and it says in the memo that uh, uh, the grant amount is $42,600. That's what the uh, state's portion will be. It's a 20% match and so we'll pay $10,650 uh, for, uh, for the work to be completed. At the end of this uh, agreement, we'll have uh, type size and location study report completed. Uh, that will give us advice on how to proceed with the final design uh, for replacement of the structure. We'll hope to do that this winter and move forward with a construction project in the, in the, in the next one to two years. Uh, so with that, I request your approval of the funding agreement and have the chairman sign the funding agreement with the DOT. I'll make the motion, but I do have a question or two. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Barth. So, DJ, I've been on that bridge. It doesn't look bad. Uh, uh, but it's always nice to get big money as in bridge improvement grant money. Uh, what's wrong with it? Primarily the condition of the substructure and, and what we call the superstructure, which is all stuff that you can't see. It's underneath the deck. Um, the hydraulics of this uh, bridge do not perform especially well. And so uh, along with the replacement of the, ex of the structure will be a significantly different channel that you see uh, going through that uh, under that roadway. So um, we look at all of our bridges and, and see what we think will compete best uh, in the uh, objective process that the DOT has for their, for their grant uh, awards uh, for this particular type of grant. And uh, this one by far was, was the best one that we could put forward for receiving the funds. And, and we, we placed pretty low on the list, but we were at least on the list to receive the funds. Uh, if we turned around today, and, and requested uh, bridge construction funds with this bridge, we probably wouldn't get it. So uh, the process that they have is, is more like a three-year process with preliminary design, final design, and construction. And so perhaps in three years, it, <coughs> would, it would be able to compete a little bit better, uh, but um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we, when we need to. <laughs> I'll ignore that. No. <laughs> okay, Commissioner. The DJ, I know this is way before you, but you know, I look at this road, and it seems like when whoever decided we should put a road here did it without a lot of foresight. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges. I mean, and the average daily vehicle is 160 or something 166. like that. 166. Wouldn't it be better just to reconstruct the road and to follow the river instead of building all these bridges? Commissioner, it's a township road, and, uh -huh. uh, and I wasn't around when they established the section lines, and so I, I, I guess I don't care to comment on that one. Yeah, I know, but I'm just looking <laughs> at the number of bridges point, there. And point it noted. <laughs> right, I agree. I think we know your answer. <clears throat> that, that being said, uh, like I've told you before in the bridge prioritization model that we use, we certainly look at uh, an option of, of doing nothing or, or closing a structure when we're looking at replacing one. And this is definitely not one that we would consider closing. Mm -hmm. Any other comments for DJ? We have a motion and a second to approve the signed agreement with the state for grant funding for the preliminary project. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Commissioners. Item 16 is to consider a motion to approve the proposed legislative resolutions for submission to the State Association of County Commissioners at four legislative action. Craig Dewey. Good morning, Craig. Your first big hill to climb. Yes, good morning. Craig Dewey, Commission Office. Uh, before you, you have 10 uh, different uh, proposed legislative resolutions for the upcoming 2018 legislative session in Pierre. And uh, it was a result of a lot of work between uh, not only Minnehaha County and Lincoln County, but a number of other surrounding communities in the area. And uh, I would defer to Commissioner Heiberger. She was part of those meetings uh, to provide a little more background on the work that all of you put in uh, to develop these priorities. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, so Rick Kiley chaired a group, and we met um, 
about five o'clock, probably I'm guessing five or six times we met to discuss some of the issues that were on the table or not on the table and we brought to the table that would be beneficial to both municipalities and uh, Minnehaha County. This is the first time we've done this. I think it was a great idea to get us off the table instead of working against each other to try to find legislative ideas together. We not only had Minnehaha County and several of our municipalities, we also had Lincoln County and the city of Worthing, um, Crooksdale Rapids, Gerritsen and Hartford also joined us. So we had mayors there and just talked about a lot of different issues that um, would affect us both all together and Craig has put together the resolutions for us and I think he's going to read through those and kind of give us background of what we've been talking about and stuff. It was really a good group and it was it's something that should have been happened a long time ago and I think we've always tried but you have to start early and this year we did we kind of started early and it was a good group. So Commissioner Bender also sat on there with me. Thank you Thank Commissioner you. Heiberger. Do you want to go ahead and read through those and give us a brief background or brief, brief summary or do you just want to uh, go through them one by one and uh, discuss and approve or or you want to take them all as one large group I think group we can take flexible I think you can take them all as one large group um, I don't think that anything's controversial these are all issues we've talked about here and are pretty much um, and so I think I think it's a good group of things and maybe Craig can just read through them and the only thing that I would maybe ask Craig if you'd take just a second and talk about the TIFs because I think that needs a little more explanation. We continually talk about that, but there's some details with this conversation, I think, about what is going to be supported or hopefully supported. So do you want to just briefly talk about that one? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. As a point of clarification, uh, would you like me to address the substance of what is in the TIF resolution? Please. I think you can still go down through all of them though, Craig, at least read through, you know, read through what they are. Sure. All right. Uh, as a, a preface to the uh, conversation, there are 10 different resolutions being proposed, including uh, resolutions on emergency radio systems, 911 surcharges, alternative publication options, workforce housing, uh, local option gross receipts tax on alcoholic beverages, uh, resolution regarding tax increment financing, also known as TIFs. Uh, citizen board compensation, drug and alcohol education, intervention and treatment programs, uh, county and municipal cooperation, and a resolution uh, regarding a failure to appear for a property tax or a property valuation appeal rather. Uh, starting out with the uh, resolution on the TIFs, uh, as you requested, Mr. Chairman, uh, there are some proposed resolutions to tax increment financing uh, regulations here in South Dakota, and uh, as a result of uh, uh, some issues that arose of uh, alleged abuse. Uh, the entire application process is being proposed to be revised uh, by the state of South Dakota and as a result of those changes in the proposed regulations uh, regarding that, uh, there would be uh, local control that would be removed uh, from uh, any uh, local municipality, local county in that process and uh, that would certainly impact the ability of Minnehaha County to determine uh, what TIFs may be most appropriate and best suited for the land that we have here in Minnehaha County. I think the key to that conversation that most of us realize because we've been through this rodeo before is the whole issue of the percentages of TIFs that are property tax abatements for a while if you will um, and how that works in the future and if the property would be uh, improved uh, without a TIF, and I think there's been conversations uh, for quite a while about that application process, and I believe that uh, this is a good conversation for us to have in a public forum. Not necessarily have to be today, but it does need to be a conversation that the city and the counties and the state need to agree on, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first resolution. Oh, sorry, anybody else? I didn't mean to butt in on that one. Go ahead, sorry. Thank you, not a problem. Uh, the first resolution that uh, we'll be covering is upgrading to a reliable statewide emergency radio system known as Project 25, uh, also called uh, and referred to as P25, uh, moving forward in this uh, resolution. Uh, statewide emergency radio systems are used in any time of crisis across the state. Uh, this resolution would uh, simply uh, call the state to uh, fund uh, upgrading the current system to the system that is currently in use by the federal government uh, using the national standard 
uh, that is in place. So it would bring uh, uh, local and statewide uh, emergency communication systems in line with what the federal government is using uh, for next generation technology. The second resolution uh, regards 911 surcharge sunset and inflationary increases for the 911 surcharge. Uh, there is a sunset clause that exists on the 911 surcharge and uh, also another factor to consider with wireless devices is that every wireless device, no matter if it is a uh, postpaid plan or if it is a pay-as-you-go plan uh, or a burner phone, uh, has to provide uh, 911 emergency access. And uh, this resolution simply calls for uh, a repeal of the sunset clause uh, as well as uh, requiring all telecom companies to collect and remit uh, the 911 surcharge for all of their devices. And uh, uh, the reason why uh, uh, this resolution calls for both of those is simply to more accurately reflect the cost of providing 911 services uh, as they exist. And uh, one uh, factor uh, in that is uh, certainly 911 surcharge was created in uh, 1989. Uh, as we know, as time passes, uh, inflation uh, does uh, impact purchasing power. And so uh, purchasing power has changed over the years and uh, allowing uh, uh, for uh, removing that sunset clause would allow uh, as the years go by and inflation uh, does take hold to uh, uh, ensure that the county would have uh, uh, ac uh, accurate and up-to-date uh, 911 service response uh, technology in time. The third resolution that is proposed uh, regards uh, alternative publication options for local government. Uh, publication notices are required by state law for uh, by open meetings laws uh, in regards to uh, a number of different things uh, such as public meeting agendas, bids, requests for proposals, name changes, uh, and other legal changes. And uh, that uh, print advertising does require a significant expense uh, by the county, particularly in counties that have uh, multiple publications uh, uh, that uh, cover the area. And so uh, this resolution uh, would support uh, an effort to uh, allow local governments to save taxpayer dollars uh, and explore alternative publication options. Uh, that would uh, also uh, entail reflecting the near universal access that citizens have to uh, the internet uh, to be able to look up those uh, different uh, uh, required publications. Uh, the next resolution is about expanding workforce housing opportunities. As we know, uh, the uh, housing market is certainly uh, hot here in the local uh, Sioux Falls area. And uh, uh, as uh, we try and uh, continue to uh, continue growth in the county and as businesses are looking to expand an adequate supply of workforce housing uh, does help ensure that uh, businesses are able to attract uh, and retain uh, local workers. Uh, affordable housing can encompass a variety of different uh, types of dwellings including uh, single family as well as uh, neighborhood revitalization and home buyer assistance programs. And uh, this resolution supports uh, expanding workforce housing opportunities and uh, another uh, benefit of uh, adequate workforce housing is that uh, it would also uh, help uh, reduce uh, crime and combat uh, neighborhood blight that uh, uh, exists and uh, may in fact prevent that before it uh, does take hold. Uh, the next resolution uh, for your consideration is a local option gross receipts tax on alcoholic beverages. Uh, as we know, uh, alcohol is a, a significant driver in law enforcement costs and other public costs uh, regarding uh, public services uh, that are provided uh, both to uh, counties as well as municipalities who are required to fund local law enforcement. And allowing a local option gross receipts tax would allow each uh, local entity across the state to best determine uh, if uh, law enforcement costs are increasing due to uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, these uh, localities can then determine if they would like to uh, increase uh, the tax, gross receipts tax on alcoholic beverages. Uh, the next proposal which we initially highlighted uh, regarding uh, uh, sustaining tax increment financing uh, while maintaining integrity of the process. And uh, again going back to the background that was provided to you at the beginning of uh, going through these resolutions, uh, tax, increment, tax increment financing has led to millions of dollars of increased property tax uh, values and increased property values uh, for uh, uh, municipalities and counties across the state. And local control certainly plays a very important role in that process. 
and uh, there are some proposed changes coming from the state regarding how the uh, TIF application process would move forward. Uh, as a result of some of those proposed changes, if they would be enacted, uh, it would result in uh, uh, reducing the amount of local control and input that could be provided uh, regarding TIFs. And uh, as uh, is a tradition across South Dakota in a number of different areas, uh, certainly local control plays an important role in this process. Uh, this resolution would uh, support maintaining local control but still allow and uh, 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 encourage the case-by-case -case enforcement if there is an alleged abuse uh, in the uh, TIF process. Uh, the next resolution for your consideration uh, is uh, regarding local government flexibility for appointed citizen boards, committees, and commission uh, compensation. And uh, certainly uh, uh, you know that uh, citizen input is required uh, for different uh, external boards and commissions. A couple of examples would be the Abandoned Cemeteries Commission as well as the Housing and Redevelopment Commission. And uh, compensation for individuals serving on these external entities is set by state law. Uh, currently some uh, uh, local boards and commissions are finding uh, difficulties in uh, recruiting as well as retaining qualified individuals. And uh, this has to do with uh, uh, some considerations that you may not uh, uh, may not have heard, you may have heard before, uh, travel time is certainly an issue in an evening. Uh, if you have uh, multiple children, child care expenses have increased over time and that has result, resulted in uh, people uh, uh, just not being able to fit it into their finances and time schedules. And uh, if uh, local, uh, local option or flexibility would be allowed in determining this uh, compensation, uh, it would uh, provide uh, uh, access to uh, more qualified, better qualified individuals to continue serving uh, on these uh, external uh, boards, committees, and uh, commissions. The next resolution for your consideration is uh, uh, supporting funding for drug and alcohol education, intervention, and treatment programs. And as was previously discussed about the local option gross receipts tax on alcoholic beverages, uh, we know that drug and alcohol abuse can cause uh, uh, not only increased crime rates, but there are other negative societal impacts and an increase in utilization of different social services, uh, including uh, human services provided by Minnehaha County. And uh, uh, the group believed that amending uh, law and appropriating funding for uh, education intervention and treatment programs would not only help deter uh, drug and alcohol abuse from occurring, but it would also help uh, mitigate uh, some of those uh, impacts that happen uh, to uh, uh, Minnehaha County in that process and ultimately result in a, a saving of taxpayer dollars. Uh, we're getting to the end here. This is uh, number nine, uh, protecting and encouraging cooperation between uh, cooperative activities between county and municipal governments. Uh, this would be one example, Commissioner Heiberger, that you worked on where uh, there is a tangible result of uh, cooperation between uh, local county and municipal governments of producing uh, resolutions that uh, uh, can be supported by a broader voice. Uh, there are also other intangible benefits such as developing the relationships for future action on larger issues as well. And uh, what this resolution would accomplish is uh, allowing municipalities and counties the option to explore avenues of collaboration. It would not mandate it, but it would allow the option should the county determine that uh, such collaboration and cooperation would be beneficial. Uh, the last resolution for your consideration would be uh, to uh, uh, establish fees for failing to appear for property tax, uh, property valuation appeals. Uh, the way the process works for uh, a property valuation appeal is that uh, uh, once an appeal is filed, there is a hearing that uh, gets scheduled in peer. That requires time uh, and travel uh, for uh, assessors uh, from equalization. Uh, not only time, but there's money and gas, other employee expenses given the trip to pier uh, and back over a day uh, does require uh, uh, meals and so forth. And so what this resolution would do is uh, uh, if someone would uh, appeal evaluation but fail to appear, uh, the county uh, would assess a $250 uh, fine uh, per appeal uh, to uh, help cover and mitigate some of the costs required uh, for this travel. Uh, this wraps up the proposed resolutions as a matter of process. I uh, would indicate to you as well that uh, last week there was a discussion about uh, uh, pursuing some sort of action regarding uh, billing for uh, uh, health care costs. And after further investigation into that subject, uh, it was discovered that the uh, State uh, Association of Welfare Directors has been looking into the issue uh, over a longer period of time. And uh, it's believed that they're preparing some action that uh, would be pursued next year. 
so that is why you don't see a, a resolution or further discussion of uh, this issue uh, at the time. And then lastly, as far as a matter of process, uh, should you uh, uh, adopt these proposed resolutions, what will happen is that uh, these will be sent to the uh, uh, committee with the State Association of County Commissioners for review as a statewide body and then a vote and approval for uh, uh, presenting them at the 2018 uh, legislative session coming up here in South Dakota. It would be available for any uh, further uh, clarifications or questions that you might have regarding uh, the process or uh, any of the individual resolutions. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate your uh, time and efforts in this. It, it's, uh, I think it's a good process for us to go to as a cooperative group to bring some of these items to uh, the association and hopefully bring some more strength, if you will, and success in getting some of these things passed. Uh, anybody have any questions for Craig, Commissioner Barge? Craig, uh, you know, uh, you referenced the medical uh, stuff. You know, one of the things that we've had happen is that bills from years ago suddenly appear. Uh, is that one of the things that the statewide organization is, is discussing? Do you know? I'm not privy to the entire discussion that they've had, but the, uh, the conversation that's being explored uh, revolves around that issue of uh, uh, when bills have come compared to the dates when service was provided. And Mr. Chairman, I know that this isn't on the list, but one of the things that I wonder if we should consider the option of uh, cremation only again as something we would want to bring to the legislature, uh, cre cremation only for the indigent, which would save us some monies and uh, save some pain for the uh, mortuary people too. But, uh, anyway, I just want to throw that out. Any other comments? I agree that there's a benefit to the county of doing that. I guess my concern is, is the more things that we bring to the association, the more watered down it gets and the more difficult uh, it will be to get 10 things proposed. Uh, the list is long and I think it'll provide some challenges, but I do think the uh, the 10 that have been worked out through the committee process is probably what we should look at this year and then add those to it next year. One of the priorities that we have to deal with is the fact that we know we won't get all 10 of these in the system and um, you let's, are go wise. With a, let's go with the bulk that we've already talked about. You are wise. Probably only two of these will get through anyway. but. Uh any other comments or questions? Um, I think we'd like to have a motion to approve those proposed resolutions. Motion to approve. Second, uh, with a question. Sure. So this will come back to us as our finished legislative priorities sometime in October, November, or is this the final? This is the final, it goes to the committee convention, if you will, in September, and then the association will approve how many, we're not totally sure of, and okay. then they will bring that to the next step. Commissioner Heiberger. One of my um, liaison reports was going to be, and I'll throw it in now, is that the South Dakota Association of County Commission Board of board meeting is in Chamberlain August 9th and 10th, and I will be attending that. And so I'll be taking those resolutions there and they will be discussed there as far as what's going forward. So yeah. that's the next step and then it goes to the convention in September. It's a long process. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. got it. <coughs> and we have two representatives, correct, from the area, uh, yourself the Southeast district and, and the, the district? Lincoln, at Lincoln County, I think Jim Schmidt might be on there. I think he's the... Uh, East River representative. Oh. Um, oh, that could be maybe Jim's that's right. replaced. Yeah. That's right. I think you're right. Be Otherwise interesting to know. Can we get that list of people? So maybe we should drop them a note of encouragement. Yeah. On whatever you want to choose. So do we have a motion and a second then to bring these to the group discussion board meeting? I guess on the eighth and ninth. Ninth and tenth. Ninth and tenth, and where is the motion? Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the legislative res resolutions for submission. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion passes. Thank you for your help. We appreciate your input.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item 17, our liaison reports. Does anyone have a liaison report? M Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to just discuss for a moment the, our, uh, our ordinance uh, that we're going to be working on next week. Uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, uh, I've already been getting contacts from people uh, about the uh, planning ordinance uh, changes. And, and I would also say that uh, people are telling me that uh, they've not been informed and we're doing this all in the dead of night. The Planning Commission has met for eight months on this. It's been on our agenda every time. And nobody has attended. I guess the Lincoln County Planning Director came. Um, the, um, the newspaper gives us zero coverage. The article that was in the paper yesterday was a result of me calling the reporter and telling him to please write an article. Um, two weeks ago when we approved the, uh, the hearing uh, for the 8th of August, uh, we, w with an Argus reporter uh, in the room, which we rarely have anymore, we looked directly at him and said, we need this to get out to the people, and nothing happened. Um, the newspaper is not doing its job, and we talk about publications. Apparently, nobody looks on the Internet. Nobody looks on, on any of these things. It's totally ineffective publishing it in the newspaper. Nobody's looking, and the newspaper isn't, even, is, isn't covering it either. I'm not sure what else we can do. If I punch Cindy, how would anyone know? Well, besides you people, I'd have to kill you all. But uh, <laughs> we, we, need, uh, we need the newspapers to step up to the plate, do their job for our community, because uh, we can do our job, but if we're functioning in, uh, in a vacuum where uh, this awareness cannot come out, um, uh, it's, it's ineffective. But going back to the hearing next week, um, if we make any any changes in in the uh, in the ordinance uh, on the fly, I would hope that we would take a moment and allow uh, our legal counsel and the planning department to review anything before we make an, a change on the fly and then approve it. In other words, if we decide to move uh, a new paragraph in or out, uh, that we make sure that it's not going to have unintended consequences. And so I, I would urge us, if next week, uh, with the public input that I fully expect, uh, that we allow the planning department and our, our legal counsel to review any changes before we uh, uh, carve it in stone. And additionally, uh, you know, our overflow room next week is not going to be available. Uh, it's going to be SRO. Uh, maybe we should charge for tickets. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, I invited Scott down if he has any uh, other comment as far as uh, the process uh, next week, because I expect it to be not necessarily contentious, but I expect us to be full of it. Once again, Scott Anderson, County Planning, and um, I have been in discussion with several people that have called me, emailed me. I know that um, the ag community ha is aware of this, and I think we will see several ag producers here. They have expressed interest in attending, and uh, I have uh, seen the emails. Uh, Jeff forwarded me a couple of emails that uh, he received, and um, to the point of how you get notice out to people, it, it's it's very difficult. I mean, it, we we do that we we do everything we can. Commissioner Barth is correct. We've been working on this for eight to nine months at the Planning Commission, and um, so it wasn't something that we just quickly devised and threw together. I mean, there's been a lot of thoughtful input and consideration by staff, legal counsel, planning commission, other producers. And, you know, I think we just need to remember that we have a current CAFO ag ordinance. And so if nothing changes, we, we, are, we, we still have that. And I, I like to take the approach when I tell people we're really trying to make some minor improvements, some minor changes that will hopefully improve the uh, potential for ag to uh, thrive in the county, and we are an agricultural county, so that's really all. Commissioner Karski. Commissioner Barth brought up a point. I'm just trying to remember. I know procedurally, and this goes back a couple of years, if there are so, any changes to the proposed um, amendments, can we approve them, or do they have to 
get remitted back to the Planning Commission? We can approve those, but we can also, if we have concerns from a legal standpoint, we can remand those back. So we have that option available to us. Okay, it's not re not required that we send it back, but it's an option for us to do. Okay. Correct. Legal counsel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Heiberger. Just one comment to Jeff's comment about the Argus leader or the papers. It's just that people have to read them too. Even when they are published, people don't always pick it up and read it. So it kind of goes all the way around. Any other liaison reports? I have uh, quite a few. <laughs> you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Okay, okay I got one. Uh, last week I spent um, uh, Tuesday and the better part of Wednesday in a sequential intercept mapping training um, put on for part of the triage project. Uh, very intense two days, a lot of people at the table. Um, one thing to you know, consider, I guess, that I just want to share with you, people, the general population that has mental health issues is somewhere between three and four percent of the population, but typically 16 to 18 percent of the jail population. So at the whole purpose of what this whole triage and sequential intercept mapping is to basically divert people from jail. And then the question becomes divert them to where? And what we've done over the, those two days is basically attempt to set out a roadmap of where we're going to go with what we know with all the resources we have available to us in the county from you know, at, at either community health, public health, um, all the different people that come into mind when we talk about if someone is having a mental health issue, who's the first, where is the first place called? It's the police are involved. And that's not typically what we want because it's just not the appropriate way to deal with that type of issue. So you'll see more and more and hear more and more about this. And I know I probably, I'm sure Aaron's back there listening, saying, no, no, no. But um, I'm, I think I've got the gist of everything that happened um, and that we went over. It, it was um, a lot of information and way over my head when it comes to the, you know, the problems that we deal with. But as a policymaker, I was able to sit in on that and try to learn as much as I can to share it with you and others. And um, hopefully I hit most of it and we can move on and get this project really get, get the rubber on the road there. So thank you. Commissioner Heiberger. I have several because I've been missing the last couple of weeks at the board meetings. So last um, two weeks ago, I was in peer for the um, criminal justice response for people with mental illness. I sit on that board now. Um, Mike Milstead also is on that and Mike Miller. And so that bro the meeting last or two weeks ago was to bring the new committee together to decide what we were going to, or how we were going to handle the bill that was passed in the legislature. We um, elected a chair, which is Craig Zadizan from the UJS, and um, uh, the vice chairs is a co-chair position between Amy Iverson, Paul Rise, and Mike Miller from Minnehaha County. At this point, they're going to be starting to set up work groups. Um, we will have several subgroups to look at different divisions of what that bill um, was putting forward to happen. And this is kind of the Oversight Council that will be looking at it. Uh, those individual subgroups will have a lot of community people put on those subgroups to do the work because we have a huge board in peer, but that's not going to be enough people to handle the amount of work I think that's going to go into this bill. Um, they already have six jails that have volunteered for the mental illness screening that's going to be done. Pennington, Minnehaha, Hughes, Falk, Charles Mix, and Coddington have already um, stepped forward and said they would do the pilot on that um, screening when that screening is approved. Um, we also have Bob Wilcox there who talked. He's the state association person that we have, and he was there and talked about the reimbursement that the counties will get for mental health screening. Um, obviously, I brought up that bill this morning on... Um, mental health evaluations and we it will, the money that the state is going to reimburse us will be a small will be one portion of different types of evaluations that we do um, there's been a cap set on how much they'll reimburse the states the, um, or reimburse the counties there's an application process the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners will be um, administering those funds and um, so the first years, you know, we've got, with a the lawyer, they've worked out the details of that. And I think that Carol forwarded you um, 
all those documents on that. But um, Bob came and talked about how that was going to go down. So that was very good. So that was two weeks ago. And then this past week, um, I was in in Ohio with Carol and Aaron Sertzka was there for a short time for the NACO, National Association of Counties um, Convention. And I sit on the Justice and Safety um, Board. So we meet ahead of time and discuss resolutions and stuff that are taken um, to Washington um, and proposed as a group of counties. And I'm just gonna, um, there were a lot we discussed. There was two days of meetings for that committee that I sit on, but I'm just gonna um, read off the list of the um, resolutions that I put my support behind as a board member that sits on that committee. Um, one was promoting parity in the health information to facilitate diversion of people with substance disorders and mental illness from um, jails to treatment. Equity in Medicare coverage for pretrial inmates. Uh, FEMA uh, we had a FEMA resolution to modify the individual assistance criteria to ensure that rural residents are treated in a fair and equitable manner. Uh, we, are, we asked for reauthor reauthorization of the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, JJDPA. Um, there was another one that was urging Congress to provide full funding for mental illness offender um, treatment and crime reduction act and then a resolution a resolution on improving pretrial justice pretrial justice continues to be one of the main topics at NACO um, some of the a couple of the different uh, breakout sessions I went to when the convention started because the convention didn't start until Saturday afternoon Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon Sunday afternoon I can't even remember. Um, but a couple of the break breakout sessions I went, one was Fundamentals of Pretrial. That was recorded. It will be on the NACO website when they get it posted. I would assume in a couple of weeks they'll have all the different ones that um, breakout sessions available will be available so you can listen to them. They're about an hour long. Um, the Fundamentals of Pretrial talked a lot about the PSA. They had three different states that are now using the PSA and the benefits that they have had. Um, they talked about uh, management shouldn't be based on should not be based on uh, a charge, but it should be based on the risk that the person is. Um, research in one of the counties that uh, spoke said that if you take a bond and you add the money and then you figure out what the release is from that, you can figure about 12 days in jail at least in their system. They have found that by doing the risk assessment and having a judicial review with tailored responses, they're keeping those people about two days. And so um, just to try, they've talked about huge reductions that they've had in their jail population by moving towards the, um, the public safety assessment, which our county is working on. Um, and I just urge you to, co to consider listening to the, some of those um, broadcasts or, or that'll be on the NACO website. Another one that I listened to was Aligning Justice, and, or was that in, uh, Aligning Justice and Health Resources to Achieve Better Outcomes. Um, and I think that's probably the end of what I had to say. Thank you. Question? Yep. Cindy, uh, would that bill that we referenced earlier be the type of bill re reimbursed by the state then? Is that for a psychological assessment? Um, I don't know if that particular one meets the criteria. If I don't think it does, that particular one would not meet the criteria for what we'll be reimbursing. There's, like I said, there's three different avenues of um, psych evaluations and we're doing a specific one and I don't think that that because that was why I contacted Tracy yesterday I don't think that has anything to do with it so. thank you mm -hmm. uh, any new business yes I have another one I was contacted by Sue Kwanbeck yesterday and um, the city is, w was requesting input for a new street signage along Dakota Avenue they are going to they've hired um, fresh produce to do placement and verbiage of new signs. They'll be putting a sign up by the new administration building and a couple other buildings and they would like some input from the county. They asked me if I wanted to sit in on that and if there was anyone else. So I have forwarded the letter to Carol and um, um, I have to get back to Sue soon. So if it's something you wanna be on or if there's someone that you think um, would be better suited than myself to sit on that, um, we can obviously take more than one person. So just um, a heads up and um, can talk with Carol about it. So they said that they would be probably they'd be um, putting signage up for the county administration building, but possibly the health and the multicultural center too. So just letting you know. I think that can be handled by staff in those conversations. I don't think that we have to have commissioners come to that. At least that's my opinion. 
Might be our facility manager that yep. should mm -hmm. attend. Okay. Any other new business? Uh, any old business? Just for the good of the cause, go to the fair. What do you say? <laughs> we Will do. Um, I'd like a motion to adjourn into executive session for personnel, contracts, and litigation. That's my motion. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. And we will be back in about 10 minutes. <laughs>